try to reflect back on kind of how did the predictions that we made kind of 10, 11 years ago and five-ish years ago, how did those play out? What do we think of them? What do we think it means for the future? So I think that's, that's, what we, that's our plan. Yes. Uh, it's um, going to be total chaos. We'll just swap back and forth. that the title is your idea, because when we discuss about uh, this talk, the most difficult part is to find a, a, a title. And what you say is, what really matters? Then we try to, to come with and to explain what really matters, but also to come back to the past. It works. It didn't work. OK. There we go, it worked. So let's just start with this slide, which is a, a, a quite some, a big and short summary of all this technology we have to put in place for the last 30 years. Because our industry is very challenging technology, very challenging industry. We have to invent uh, almost every day. We have to, to invest a lot of money and reduce the risk. We always had to improve the technology to increase our skills and know-how and to integrate more advanced technology. And one of the key elements for which allowed us to, to do that was HPC. HPC was a perfect tool during the last 30 years to give us the opportunity to, to integrate more physics, to be able to implement more and more complex algorithms to solve our problem, to, see, to be able to see better, faster, more, with more accuracy, and also to take advantage of all the data coming from different sources. And you will see there is more and more data. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, think for me, one of the things to reflect on from that far back now is you know, I think we knew in our gut that <coughs> Because the companies involved in the energy business, and this probably <laughs> will in the future involve any energy business, not just oil and gas, have to make very long time horizon, very capital intensive bets. Ultimately, somebody has to do it. Somebody has to build the infrastructure. Somebody has to undertake the capital projects. That actually creates the space for scientists, engineers, technical people uh, to, to make a real difference, right? Because you know, if you get those investments wrong, well, I mean, you can crater the whole company. You can crater really big companies, not just a little startup. You can crater a massive company if you get that stuff wrong. So even if we have a hard time kind of doing the spreadsheets and the accounting, and you know, if you've ever had to deal with your accounting department like I do, I mean, oh, God. But in the end, fundamentally, they know, yeah, we kind of need the science to work right. And so much of what we do in science is now underpinned by computation. It creates the space that we have a chance to deliver the values that we deliver. I think we knew that back in 2011, even if we couldn't really say it that clearly. I think we knew it. I think we still know it now. So look, look back to 2011. So at that time, it was uh, our third, fourth meeting. And John, Scott, and uh, I were asked to, to present some, uh, some ideas on, about uh, seismic. And do we need the use? <laughs> to use an exaflop system. Then we, we came up with a, a presentation. And the, the next three slides will uh, summarize this, uh, this, uh, this uh, talk. Uh, at that time, we were entering in a post-petaflop uh, era. Petaflop systems were already available and available to industry. Uh, all essentially were cluster. GPUs, GPUs were, was existing at that time an interesting technology, but not fully at its maximum of interest. Many people were still doing a lot of work on it. But oil and gas already found a strong interest in this technology to accelerate their code, mostly the seismic depth imaging code. We had, uh, we, at that time, we had a larger microprocessor uh, ecosystem. And it was the end of vector machine, and the MPPs were mostly gone. And what you, well, what you can see, the top one was a pure CPU machine. It was uh, the K computer for, for, uh, for Spark. And what we can see also is that we had a, a large diversity of uh, accelerating technology from NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, with <laughs> uh, many core technology. Then the, the technology was evolving fast at that time. I mean, I guess maybe the only remark I'll make on this one is it's only kind of visible in hindsight, I would say. 
it was the death of specifically general purpose microprocessors, right? I mean, what I would claim is, sorry, Keith, the Intel processors that Intel makes are not specifically general purpose scientific architectures, right? I mean, they're specifically general purpose, general purpose, right? But not necessarily scientific. But it was funny to see way up there that the top machine was a Spark microprocessor. That was a specifically general purpose technical architecture. <coughs> that, in hindsight, I would say was a, a sad rev rele revelation, sorry, uh, that technical computing no longer drove the development of computer architectures at that point. Uh, couldn't really tell then because we didn't really know what the future was going to hold. But I think in hindsight, you can see that was an inflection point. Then from uh, on our side, at that time, we had a strong push from the oil and gas industry to develop advanced seismic technology, such as reverse time erosion and full form inversion. It was uh, the really, really the beginning of uh, the, uh, the, the use at routinely and at full speed of this technology. Another point very important also at the time was the evolution of the acquisition system. More data, larger data, more complete data. And we were thinking that integrating more physics into the, to, 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 to our technology leading to more expensive algorithms was important. Then we had to, to speculate. And this time to speculate was from John, and I let him to explain this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, it depends on where you are in this business, right? If you're in the business of providing a routine technical product to a customer, Efficiency is probably the name of the game, right? You'll be driven by your managers to be efficient. But for those of us who are primarily working on pushing the forefronts of technology, <coughs> you've got to have a way of testing ideas that are not actually risky, but are at least technically risky. At least there's a risk that they won't work the first time you try them. You need to have a venue to do that. And it was clear that that was, I, I claim it's still true today, in fact, maybe even more so today than it was then. That was the point I was trying to make there is, with all of the explosion in technologies that we were seeing, I think we got all those predictions right. I think the predictions around what full waveform inversion would do, thematically, I think we got that all correct. Uh, certainly the explosion of kind of data density, certainly seismic data density, I think we got those predictions essentially exactly correct. I mean, scary correct even. And I think the one thing I wanted to remind you of was all of that increase in technology and available compute and data and all that stuff meant Scientists need more time to take technical risk and check things out and try to innovate and actually do things, not just deliver day-to-day -day work, but actually do new stuff. So I'm, I'm glad I made that claim, whatever it was, 12, 13 years ago, because I think it's true. Well, an interesting point is we were very confident that our uh, industry can use post-metaflopic or pre exascale technology because most of, their, of our algorithms are based on time matching finite difference wave equation methods which is exaflop friendly. Most of our process, processing are embarrassingly parallel. It's easy to, to, to distribute. And we can also find more parallelism inside the algorithms itself, domain decomposition, multi-threading, and now acceler acceleration. But we needed tools to program all this, which was not very, very simple at the time. And tools with rel and reliable systems and this was also one of our main concerns, having access to this. But we thought that uh, we were able to, to, to build and to use such system. Yeah, I think, I think the way we would have reflected on this is we were confident. We were confident at the time. We kind of knew the classes of algorithms we were wanting to run. We knew kind of what the future trajectory of those kind of looked like. We looked at the trajectory of hardware and com available compute and computer languages and compilers and all of the supporting infrastructure we need. And I would say we were like, okay, this is gonna work. We're gonna do it. And, and again, I think, I think, I don't know, I'd be curious to see what you say maybe in the questions, but I think we did deliver that. So, so far, so good on the predictions. So after six years, we came back again, Scott, John, and we have a sphere once Berdal with us and we did, again, one presentation during this conference with the question, how did we do? Can we still use an exaflop machine? So at the time, 
Petaflop system were on production on some site uh, or very close to be on production in some oil and gas industry. Then we were using it for our processing. The GPU is, uh, was, uh, was becoming a standard, most, more and more used in the industry. We were, it has been demonstrated that this technology was the correct answer to our algorithms to accelerate the computation and reduce the, the time, the processing time, what we need to, to, to solve our problem. And also there was another very important topic we, never, we didn't see back to 2011 was the energy efficiency. The cost of the energy was becoming a key point for choosing the system and for defining system at the time. But also there was something uh, else was the programming. Programming became also harder. We had to spend a lot of time. And we saw also that a number of CPU architecture died at that time and replaced by what we know today. And what is interesting is, as you can see, that back to 2017 is NVIDIA GPU, oh, sorry, NVIDIA GPU was starting to, to uh, uh, dominate. But also we had what, uh, the green 500 rank and a GPU machine was the first one at the time. Yeah, so I, th I think my thoughts around this were, I mean, I remember, I remember roughly speaking when Keith blew the circuit breaker on BP's Westlake campus because, well, somebody hit return on a big job and that pulled enough extra power that the whole thing came cratering down. That was, I think it was after 2011, but it was certainly well before 2017 because I think we started building the building in 2013. There was probably two classes of entities involved in kind of that statement around the energy efficiency. Those who were already running first class data centers, you know, class A data centers were already dealing with these problems. But actually their growth trajectory in terms of the compute that they're adding was probably already leveling out. And those, at least in our case, like, uh, like BP and maybe Total too, who were still growing like crazy, right? We still saw huge frontiers ahead of us for growth of computation. It was like, oh God, we're gonna have to deal with this energy thing. All right, it's gonna really kill us. Uh, so, you know, Keith, Keith has a building out there sitting on I-10 that he yeah. was, well, you weren't the architect, but anyway, you, you basically got to choose what it looked like. But we can add that Scott Morton was a pioneer on this topic because GPUs was part of his processing for many years ago and was one of the first using at, uh, at scale for his uh, time, for his processing. Then in 2017, uh, the HPC in oil, uh, or, uh, or in oil, or HPC and was still driven by oil and gas and by seismic depth imaging. Uh, or, sorry, in uh, oil and gas, HPC was still driven by seismic depth imaging, RTM mostly, routinely. Uh, back to early 2000, nobody was uh, trusting that RTM will become so important. And full waveform inversion, again, full waveform inversion was a very risky and uh, uh, technology back to uh, end of the 2000s and early 2010. My PhD was on the full waveform inversion back to 1984, so it's a long time ago. But uh, the question is, why are we not routinely running elastic RTM? Because we were confident at the time that with the progress of the acquisition, we will uh, be able to deal with multi-component data and, and uh, more complex data and we will uh, have uh, elastic wave equation implemented and reverse time aggression running uh, in elastic mode uh, uh, routinely. Because maybe it was too expensive or be, I don't know why or we didn't, every time we ask this, we don't have the data, it, it's too expensive. And one thing also is TTI, uh, uh, RTM was very good at what we were expecting in imaging process. So maybe it, because we, the, the scenario was to go shorter and faster, having a turnaround shorter and faster, maybe this is why RT, TTI RTM warns the button. But also another interesting point is that FWI become, became more and more important uh, since in 2017 
and pushing all the technology we are developing. So, I mean, as someone who's now ah, getting to the nearly the end of their career, probably at, in this, so maybe you'll never invite me back because by then I'll just be off in the woods living in a cabin somewhere. Um, an observation. From when I joined the SEG in 1983 until sometime in the mid 2000s, I actually, actually have to go back and look at the actual record. Seismic migration was the number one technical topic in the journal Geophysics and at the SEG annual technical program. Right? It held like a 30 year dominant streak. Then you could see when full waveform inversion first started really working and delivering value, pretty quickly it was going to be eclipsed. So it probably took you know, from a time when there were only a few academic presentations on full waveform inversion still remaining, because a lot of the original practitioners, like Henri, had kind of given up, right? Because the computations were too big and the company didn't recognize the value and they were doing lots of migrations, which were looking pretty good. Um, what happened was, ah, pretty quickly it started working. And so within probably three years, <laughs> full waveform inversion went from 15 papers to 150 papers, right? Now look what's happened. So in the time, and that happened in that time frame, the 2011-2017 time frame, that full waveform inversion was the most dominant topic in applied geophysics, industrial geophysics. It's not, it's already not now. It's already been eclipsed by machine learning, right? Machine learning has already displaced it. So for those of you who are younger, I think for the, my age and up, you could probably just ignore what I'm about to say, it doesn't matter. Um, for the younger ones, the cycle time of the turnover of the hot, technologies is getting faster. And we're almost running the risk of aliasing it, right? I mean, if you just have somebody back every three or four years, a whole topic might have come and gone in between their appearances. So that's, that's an interesting aspect of this. Again, I think our predictions were good. I think we got the full waveform inversion stuff right. Jury's still out on the elastic stuff. Not sure how I land on that one. I put that comment around, maybe it just doesn't have any value. That was my comment. I added that to Henri's slide. Uh, I don't think that's actually true, but that's a provocative question. So you can decide what to do with that. <laughs> so since 2017, what we realized that the computing requirement <coughs> continued to grow. In two, so 2017 and after, we, want, we still wanted to compute better and faster to, to integrate more physics, to combine different, uh, <coughs> different physics and more interaction to come to close to the interactive uh, pre-stack depth imaging or during a drill and pre-drill and update and, uh, and introduce more advanced uh, technologies such as uh, uncertainty quantification or integrating more data. But not only seismic uh, for uh, the comp computing growth for seismic, seismic technology, but also for reservoir simulation. And the, 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 the need for computing faster, integrating different reservoirs and combining more and more complete process uh, was very important. A massive simulation, a more complex uh, target, new physics for UR. So all this uh, technology require a huge growth in, comp in computing resources. And in 2017 and after, there was still a strong push in our industry for that. How many reservoir engineers in the audience? One, two, three, <laughs> all right. All right, so I'm, here's, so over the last couple of years, I've had the privilege of getting to know someone not quite as far along in their career as me, but, but kind of close-ish, who's kind of our number one advocate for high-end reservoir engineering. Um, and he and I constantly have this debate. Why are they so different in terms of their usage of high performance computing? I mean, seismic, we just tend to gobble, gobble, gobble. We gobble all we can, right? It's never enough. Give us more, 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 more. And the reservoir engineers never, at least in my company, maybe in yours, maybe not. So maybe this doesn't apply to your company. Uh, don't seem to be growing quite as voraciously in their appetite as we do. Uh, and so the debate I have with them is, is reservoir engineering basically just settled science? There are no scientific frontiers. They're just engineering frontiers. You know, doing ensembles, doing a little faster, fine tuning the workflows, <coughs> post-processing the results to make better informed business decisions. Is that all that's left? Or is there new science? And well, we sometimes get way down in the weeds of, hey, actually in how you use probabilistic reservoir simulation, probably there is some science in. Uh, but 
They're not changing their fundamental simulators of fluid flow. Not, not, well, there's some things that he'll say, uh, yeah, if we could do that, that might be cool. But what, if I ask him, okay, how many people in our company are actually writing a reservoir simulator and testing and, that and out? Are, the answer, the answer is low. Little bit also. Not compared to the number of people we've doing seismic algorithms. So I, is seismic unique in the sense that a slightly better algorithm, a slightly better numerical formulation, a new way of processing the data, whatever it is, can be so important and transformation and valuable that, uh, God, it just pays to keep pouring on the science. So, you know, when we get to the kind of these new energy frontier discussions coming up here, um, yeah, which way are they going to go, right? Are they going to go the way that seismic went, which is just essentially an infinite appetite for computing? Or are they going to go more the way that, at least in my company, reservoir engineering went, which was more of a technical computing discipline that has a predictable, stable, modest overall appetite for these kind of things? I don't know. It's an interesting, it's an interesting thought. Yes, and just looking at how many people raise their hands as reservoir engineers. Uh oh. <laughs> John, we have well, to we'll, we'll get a question up. from you at the end. John, we have to speed up a little bit, no, otherwise we never finish. On time. Um, so, a very important point was the, the increase of input data from more diverse uh, origin and the integration of the data. Machine learning was a big step after 2017 and becoming more and more important in our, in our uh, uh, industry. And we had so many data for, for the, the year, 20 years of, of process. Then taking advantage of all this uh, data through machine learning was a big challenge to, to increase our productivity man, mainly. <coughs> I will make my remarks on machine learning later, so go ahead. So also an important point is the HPC evolution. So the HPC system are becoming more, uh, much more complex and more and more complex. In 2017, we were uh, told that Moore's law will end up by 2025. Maybe yes, maybe no. Are we sure of this statement? We don't know, but we still see a, a, a good evolution of the uh, HPC performance. But for sure, classical uh, computers have, uh, have physical limits, fundamental <coughs> limits. Energy consumption is one of them. And what we see that the HPC system will become more and more heterogeneous and then more and more complicated to program. And we will have to adapt our algorithm in such a way that we can take advantage of this uh, complexity. And there is also something which is very important and new at that time since uh, 20, 20, 2017 is cloud computing. Cloud computing has become part of our equation for our data center or for our processing. And we have to more and more integrate them in, in our daily basis uh, technology. And I will make my remarks on cloud computing later as well. <laughs> so now where are we in 2023? So the, big, the biggest assumption is we moved from uh, oil and gas focused to energy focused companies or industry. Seismic exploration is, is still dominate our workload and is, uh, is, is still the most important part of our computing uh, resources. But we have more and more application on our system which are not seismic. We are expecting more users and, and different application, more disparate and even conflicting uh, with conflicting needs, all of them compared to what we do. What we see is uh, we see wind, solar energy, battery, new catalyzer, new material uh, uh, research uh, in chemistry uh, for renewable energy, for reducing the footprint carbon storage. So there are many, many new users in, uh, in our landscape. We have to take care and to take into account on uh, and they will use more and more our HPC system, then our HPC will, will need to evolve to answer to their need. But what we think is that seismic is unlikely to shrink on its own, but it will, be, it will become a smaller spice of, of the pie, meaning that we will have to deal with more and more users. I think that's probably an accurate description of kind of our prediction too, you know, kind of seeing inside our company 
Actually, the applications he mentions are almost identical, so maybe that's scary. It would be nice if we thought we were maybe doing something different and distinctive, but I, I think that's the conventional wisdom. So that's a prediction. So what you do is you benchmark us five years from now and see how that turned out. I don't know, but I th I'd say that is the conventional prediction of how it's going to go. And I see the evidence of it kind of behaving that way right now. In our shop, Seismic still 80-ish plus percent of our HPC load. So how does HPC change? Data size won't get smaller. We will have more and more uh, experimental and operational data and the need to an interactive feedback. They will get more mixed, so building a file system will become quite a, a, a challenge and certainly difficult. Moving the data around will al always be a significant challenge for us, mainly if we use more and more cloud systems for, for our processing. So how do we feed? And the use of advanced analytic, data analytic and uh, AI will be, is now part <coughs> of our workflow. And always when we develop new algorithms, we, we integrate this uh, in, our, in our design. So I think the, I agree. I, I think that's the conventional prediction. Uh, not, not to be derogatory about it. I mean, I think that's the wisdom. If you look at what's going on today, that's the direction things are mildly trending. I guess the only question I ask is, will there be something disruptive to that model that, that I, none, none of us are anticipating? Maybe somebody's out there working on something that's going to disrupt that model. I'm unaware of it. Um, actually, I hope somebody is working on something that disrupts yeah. that model. So as we already said, we have a diverse marketplace, CPU, GPUs, quantum technology. We have heard a lot about quantum technology since 2017. Uh, myself, I did a lot of work on that, uh, trying to explore how it can be useful to us. Uh, but what we need is getting HPC system more programmable, easier for, for the user. It's, uh, it's, we cannot have, and now it's more and more uh, the reality, we have many different, many different uh, um, uh, uh, GPU coming in the market. So how do we program them? The cloud computing we already discussed a lot about. And energy efficiency is also uh, a main topic for us when we design a data center. So we have to, instead of uh, doing and relying on single binary application, more and more we will have to optimize end-to-end -end workflows. This will become a priority because diverse technology and also within our algorithms diverse uh, workflow. So I guess what I do is just, uh, again, I agree. I mean, I think when Henri put these slides together, and by the way, he did do all the work putting the slides together. Um, here's the way I felt about those statements. Oh, it's a little bit depressing if it actually turns out exactly that way. But what I would say is if if you are willing to invest the effort to be good at things that are important to whatever it is you're doing, all of this complexity and uncertainty and you know, complexity of total end-to-end -end workflows and complexity of the computing landscape and programming landscape and all that stuff, if you're willing to put in the effort, that's a real opportunity. Because actually a lot of people are going to get mired in the details and kind of flounder around in some of those complexities. So I'd, I'd say it does present an opportunity for people who really are passionate about this space to excel above their competition if they choose to invest. Yes, but HPC will stay as a key enab enabler of business value for us. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that any other way either. So just to, uh, I just want to illustrate uh, some new development and new orient, uh, orientation with uh, this new technology. We are, we are moving. Uh, to a fully integrated multi-domain simulation, uh, multi-HPC resource problem. Here is an example from my colleague Bertrand Denel, and don't miss the call of Adrien today at 12.30. Here is, we use uh, CO2 injection, CO2 modeling injection to train a network to find, to inverse the uh, plume evolution and to predict the plume evolution in, uh, in, uh, in the reservoir. So this is integrated. All the tools, gravimetry, uh, CO2 simulation are integrated in a multi-platform HPC uh, platform simulation, multi-physics. So this is one example. Another example is exactly the same, where we do, within, 
by representing uh, with the same model representation, seismic reservoir, we can do the CO2 injection simulation inside the reservoir and the seismic, the corresponding seismic, to to model and to to monitor the CO2 CO2 injection. This is uh, a work done with a team we set up, the Makutu team, a collaboration with uh, INRIA in France. And don't miss uh, Xavier Lacoste talk tomorrow. So all this is uh, integrated in something which I think is quite new, at least on my, my side, is we have a, a, a huge collaboration with Stanford, uh, Laurence Livermore, around a software platform named GOSX, which is uh, designed for, uh, as a multi-platform, multi-physics platform for CO2 storage, targeting next-gen uh, supercomputing. The good point, and it came back to the discussion we had this morning, is it's an open source uh, platform, providing, providing, uh, uh, providing the necessary uh, environment for numerical methods, for software architecture, uh, programming model, a unified programming model to, to target the, the different, uh, different technology. It's flexible enough to be able to couple different physics within the same code, within the same uh, model and data representation. And uh, take advantage of the different resources we can have access from a, a laptop to exascale system. And what is also new for us to us is we consider that as a library of optimized solver, we can import in our Python script to develop workflows and specific application we need to. So this is something which is quite interesting to us and which is quite new uh, in, in the way of working. You want to add something? I'll just say, I, I think, generally speaking, open source is good. So I, I think I like that direction. I think it's necessary to help combat the complexity that you're seeing emerge. And then I'll let you go. Ah, this okay, now, yeah, now comes my pontification. We're gonna make it, <laughs> barely. Um, well, actually, I, I, I think I asked the audience this question last year, or some form of it, and that is, we keep predicting the emergence of the real value of integration and multidisciplinarity. And, but you know, inside my own mind, I struggle with that, because I know it would take me a while to learn how to write a good reservoir simulator. And maybe it would take me a long time to learn how to do it. Maybe I don't even have enough time left to do it. So then how do we, how do we how do we combine efforts in a way that somebody who does geophysical skills, seismic data processing, somebody who actually knows machine learning, you know, down in its real guts, somebody who knows down in the guts of fluid flow and porous media, really can capture all that in their brain, right? How do they really do it? Now, you know, I, I'm, I, maybe I'm kind of weird. I'm, I must admit, I might be a weird individual, so you can discount that if, this if you like. But if I can't kind of capture a lot of the details in my own head, the interface between me and somebody else always has to be simplified in some way, right? Now, this open source stuff is a part of simplifying those interfaces, so that's good, I like that. But I, I just don't know if all of this multidisciplinary stuff is really gonna be top-notch science. I don't know, right? Now, if some of you will prove me wrong, I think the civilization of this planet will thank you, right? Because there will be value there. It just seems to be hard to do. Um, all right, so here we go. Here's maybe some more of my personal pontifications. Uh, you have um, a slide? Or? Uh, no, not yet. Um, yeah, around, around cloud. It's, I find it weird that people are proud of using other people's computers. <laughs> I just find that weird, right? Now, if they're giving you a really good price, what the hell, right? But, you know, are they really? So the question is, what does cloud mean in an efficient marketplace, right? Does it really become like an electric utility thing where, hey, I just turn on the light bulb and they work, right? And then it's got to work like an electric utility thing. It's got to have predictable pricing, it's got to have a pricing model that works with me the way I want to work. Otherwise, maybe I'll generate my own power, which, by the way, I do. Um, but I'm weird, I said that. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how cloud really evolves in an efficient marketplace. I'm not saying it will go away. I think what I would say is, I think I have it on the next slide. We're at kind of peak hype of cloud now, right? The amount of people who are going to say, I'm even twice as interested in cloud next year as I was last year. No, that's not going to happen. You're going to be just as interested in cloud next year as you are this year. So you might be quite a bit interested in it, but your enthusiasm isn't going to double in a year or two. It's going to stay flat. So that's what I mean by peak cloud. 
Um, actually, I think we have a real opportunity to use computing for human good, right? I mean, I think that's what we do. We solve problems, we build better products, we build things that make the world more efficient economically, which means everybody's standard of living goes up. So I think you're part of that, all of you doing that. Um, do we actually deliver that promise? If we do, then there's a huge population of the world that's going to climb that human development index scale. And guess what they're going to do? I mean, this is the energy conference, right? Energy and HPC. They're going to use more energy. So if we're good at what we do, we're going to generate more demand for our products. So I think you'll all still be employed. I don't think there's any risk of that. Um, all right, yeah, next slide. Um, yeah, so that was my peak cloud statement. Uh, I guess. Since we're near the end, I'll try to leave you with just one remark. I think we'll always be curious about what is under our feet. If you're a geophysicist, you're going to be curious about what's down there, right? And you'll find a way to make money out of it. <coughs> Maybe not as much money as historically the hydrocarbon business kind of tended to make, but you'll still find a way to make money. And then I would say the people who can pose fundamental problems and challenges in a physical language solve them with numerical algorithms and make predictions and help inform investments and judgments and decisions. No, you got a bright future ahead of you. It, that will always be in demand. It'll always be useful. So that, that's probably my last remark. And thank you very much. Do we have time for questions or zero questions? Uh, I think we've got time for several questions. Bring them on. OK, our reservoir engineer, go for it. Wait for the mic. Michael Brule with AWS, a former reservoir engineer with Shell. I, I have a question uh, about um, your point about um, reservoir simulation not escalating its needs for HPC. And my question is, is, is this traditional separation of geophysicists and exploration activities still separate from reservoir engineering all these years later? And I ask because we have voracious needs for HPC and reservoir simulation, for example, in compositional simulation. Um, you know, rich gas condensate reservoirs. We have it for 4D simulation. If you follow the work of Ali Dogru from Aramco, he's now at MIT, but they had billion cell uh, reservoir simulations, embarrassingly parallel, and, and they needed a lot. They had their own data center just for that. So it, it's, it's reservoir simulation does have a need for HPC. So is this separation still exist? Because I would infer from your comment that Guys don't talk. So I, th I think it's, it's, it's probably very organization dependent. And so, yeah, I mean, you can sit there internally and say like, yeah, what he's saying sounds nuts. I, actually, what I tell my reservoir engineering friend is, this seems nuts, right? How come you guys aren't pushing the boundaries? Surely there are interesting things to do along the lines of what you mentioned. Uh, but I guess it's for each of you to kind of benchmark in your own mind, how does it feel to you? I think. I don't think any of the major energy concerns that do subsurface business would say, seismic's not that important. Yeah, we can just kind of buy that. I think they all say, no, 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 we're good at seismic. It's super important. I think it's much more heterogeneous what they say about high-end reservoir engineering. I mean, they're all doing reservoir engineering. They're all doing HPC and reservoir engineering. But are they putting as many thought leaders and HPC kind of directional trends and leadership into the reservoir engineering side as the seismic side? There may be some companies that are, and maybe, when I interviewed with Exxon back in like 1987, reservoir engineering was bigger than seismic. Seismic was the poor guys. Reservoir engineering dominated. I don't know if that's true now. We can ask the Exxon guys if they can disclose that. Uh, so it was curiosity. So I knew it was heterogeneous, uh, but everybody claims to be good in seismic. Not everybody claims or seems to want to claim to be good in reservoir engineering. You know, at the forefront of the science. I'm not talking about day-to-day -day routine application of managing their fields. They all want to be good at that. Luke Decker, Chevron. I, I wanted to pile on with the reservoir engineering comment. I'm not really a reservoir engineer. I, I work with John Washburn. I do FWI stuff. But I think it's important to remember that we're primarily a bunch of seismic people here, so we're stuck in our silo. Reservoir engineering is what actually makes money for the company, right? 
And uh, if we went across the street to CAM and we, we looked at like the faculty that they have there in interdisciplinary applied math, I think they have one professor of seismic and they have maybe four or five who do Galerkin methods for reservoir simulation. And the math that they need to use in reservoir simulation is significantly more challenging than what we need to do in the seismic domain. And there's all kinds of really cool technologies that they have, like multi-grid methods for looking at fracture uh, propagation, uh, that I, I think to write it off as a settled science is, is not an accurate characterization. Uh, also, I think if, if we make forward-looking statements about how is how is our industry going to evolve in the coming years? I think we can look at where we're lagging behind other uh, similar disciplines in computational science. And in that regard, I think it's uh, randomized numerical linear algebra. So there's some really cool work that Georgia Tech's been doing, like Matthias Labouten, I believe is his name, for like low rank approximation uh, in imaging and FWI. And I think there's just so much low-hanging fruit and room for innovation there that we haven't yet captured as a discipline. Don't disagree. Was there a question? Yes. <laughs> I wanted to pile on. Addison okay. Snell with Piled Intersect. Piled on successfully. <laughs> Addison Snell with Intersect 360 Research. I love that we were talking about exascale for oil and gas. Do you have a prediction about when we'll see an exascale system at, uh, at an energy company? And does anyone want to volunteer to go first? Oh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that anybody's afraid of some of the aspects of it. I, I think the challenge is, well, probably secretly, there's one entity that's already actually pretty damn close, actually. I, I won't disclose who they are, but that's up to them. I suspect there's one that's actually quite close now, like three quarters of or 80% of. Um, I expect they'll make it within a year or two. Their trajectory seems to be continuing to grow. I, I think oil and gas operators, well, you saw the story that we told, right? Our, our landscape in terms of the attention of our management and what our management is fascinated with has become more multifaceted now. Uh, so if wind simulations or carbon sequestration simulations demanded that scale and had a business driver for doing it, yeah, they wouldn't have any problem doing it. Um, so far, I'm not seeing that out of those applications. Seismic is still dominating. But what we have is our senior executives all running around saying, well, what we said, basically, seismic will still be there. It'll still grow. But it's a shrinking part of a growing pie. So I don't know that we will be in command of that purchase order. It'll have to be a more integrated, the entire technical computing community says we need that scale of resources. But they're people who make their living crunching numbers and selling the results day by day by day. They're getting close now. Thank you. Purchase order. That's the key word. <laughs> yeah, you, probably. you spoke about energy, energy consumption. A couple of years ago, we, th we saw that go through the roof. We were thinking about gigawatt installations for our supercomputers. And that hasn't happened, right? Frontier uses 20 megawatts, something like that. The energy bill per year will be a couple million dollars. But this, this, the cost for the systems have exploded. If you look at the top 500, that has gone up by factors real time over the years. Frontier is what, $500 million? I asked uh, Jack Dongara the same question. He just simply didn't want to talk about cost. Does <laughs> cost impact us? Well, maybe Jack has the privilege of not needing to worry about talking about cost. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, I would, yeah, but I think. What you're less likely to see, I think, I claim, it's just, it's a prediction based on the fly, just kind of based on your comments and the rest of what I'm hearing from you. It's more likely that we'll see is exaflop scale total installed compute, but not available to a single application, right? That we're very close to. Maybe actually there are places that are probably already over that and just don't tell you about it. Um, certainly the big cloud providers probably have reached that scale for sure. It's just distributed, right? Um, Again, one of the things, again, it's the kind of the reservoir engineering versus the seismic discussion. Us seismic guys, we're like, no problem. We can deal with that. We can use a distributed compute resource, no big deal, because we can decouple a lot of things that we're doing. I agree with the remark that the numerics in reservoir simulation is a lot more complicated and tougher than in seismic. Seismic is kind of dead dumb simple, actually. But that means we can use lower grade resources scattered over <coughs> a larger area more easily than others. Um, 
So I, I think people are reaching the scale. They're just not putting it all in one building and letting one person command the whole thing for a significant amount of time. The national labs may have that privilege of doing that. They'll be the ones that look like that. The industrial users will diffuse their usage. And 20 megawatts is uh, quite a, a lot in terms of operational cost. I don't know how it is in US, but I can tell you in Europe, it's not negligible. <laughs> Well, just think of what, you know, in 15 years, 20 years, 30 years in the future, for those of you in Texas, uh, the average Bucky's will have to have a 20 megawatt power drop just to charge vehicles. <laughs> 20 megawatts will be nothing. I think as much as I hate to cut the conversation, we probably should. Thank John and Henri for this.